My name is Otavio Ferraz. I'm the co-director of the Transnational Law Institute and also an affiliate of the Brazil Institute here at King's College London. And I have the pleasure to have here with me today Catherine Seeking, the Ryan Family Professor of Human Rights Policy at Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, Catherine came here yesterday for a day-long symposium and a public lecture on her most recent book, Evidence for Hope, Making Human Rights Work in the 21st Century. And we have the privilege to interview Catherine now uh, about her work on human rights. Catherine, thank you so much for coming here today to do this interview. Uh, we were together yesterday in this day-long symposium and then a public lecture on your book. So it's a privilege for us here at King's College uh, uh, Law School and particularly for the Transnational Law Institute, which is celebrating five years uh, this year, uh, to be able to talk to you about our important work uh, on human rights. And I was uh, thinking of starting with a more biographical question, if you don't mind. Not at all. Because uh, we, when we see a, a, a well-accomplished, widely cited, internationally recognized scholar like you on a particular field like human rights, we tend to think that uh, your career was like uh, uh, linear, like no changes, uh, no chances, like, uh, and uh, this is often not the case, right? And from some of what. Uh, the biographical things you include in your books, I suspect that yeah, there was also a bit of serendipity, uh, luck, changes of uh, text in your, in your own career. Could you tell us a bit about that? How do you, did you end up doing human rights research, or was that always what you thought from a very early age that you wanted to be? <laughs> what a great question. Um, so I grew up in a small Midwestern town in Minnesota, St. Cloud, Minnesota. And so first, I always wanted to escape. <laughs> and I had the chance to do that because my father was a professor at a, at a small college and he had a sabbatical when I was 15 and I went to Spain to, and under Franco. We're talking 1970. Mm. And so my first experience with a, a repressive regime actually came when I was very young. and, and the, the last years of the Franco regime, but still watching the Guardia Civil, you know, kind of walk around in a threatening way uh, in Spain. Um, but my real education with human rights came when I was an undergraduate student at the University of Minnesota, and we had an exchange relation with the University of the Republic in Montevideo, Uruguay. And I went, uh, it was an exchange where one student from my university went to Uruguay and one Uruguayan student came to my university. Um, and that was 1976 at the depths of the Uruguayan dictatorship. So two dictatorships, Spanish <laughs> and then Uruguayan. Uh, and so it was a, a huge education for me to study in Uruguay and, and meet friends. Some had been imprisoned, some had been tortured, but the, see how the university was what they call intervened, right? In other words, the government, the repressive government controlled the university entirely, fired professors, hired professors, canceled classes. And so that experience of living under a repressive regime marked me and marked my life and my research. But when I went to do my uh, PhD, I discovered that actually human rights was not considered a very appropriate topic for someone studying international relations uh, or political science. It was considered too normative, uh, too political. Uh, and so my initial research was not about human rights. Yeah, it was on development in Argentina and Brazil, right? Exactly. Uh, and you may appreciate this. Back in the day, there was sort of a notion that if you wanted to work on human rights, you should work on economics, political economy. It was still the idea that the political economy determined everything else. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I thought that would, I believed also I should know more about political economy. And so I studied the, I studied the Economic Commission for Latin America uh, at, at CEPAL, uh, some of the uh, 
great leaders of that were still alive, Raul Prebisch, mm -hmm. <laughs> Aníbal Pinto, Celso Furtado, um, and looked at the influence of those ideas on economic policy in Brazil and Argentina. And did you do field work as well for that it's, PhD? I you spent, lived there? I spent a year in, in Argentina and eight months in Brazil. Okay. So my very rusty Portuguese comes from okay. 1986 living for eight months in You're Brazil. You're very good Portuguese, <laughs> actually. So you had a lot of experience of Latin America through your uh, research, but did you have also any other connections or was purely uh, accidental uh, that you ended up in, in Latin America? Mm -hmm. Family well, or friends? Uh, no, I mean, that, then I had the opportunity when I finished my undergraduate degree, I received an a internship from the Ford Foundation to work for a year at a human rights organization in Washington, D.C., called the Washington Office on Latin America. In Wola, yeah. Wola, exactly. And so that was just another huge eye opener for me. And in that capacity, I, I then, as a staff person, uh, I, I worked to help receive human rights activists who came from Argentina and from Uruguay to Washington, D.C., and help uh, arrange uh, visits for them and interviews with them, with congressional staff people, people in the State Department, uh, press. Uh, and I, so I was more an, an assistant, to, and I did a lot of translation for uh, those actors. So then I met people from the Madres de la Plaza de Mayo, Las Abuelas de la Plaza de Mayo, uh, people from the cells, uh, and so my contacts came through with people in the Argentine Human Rights Movement and the Uruguayan Movement came through that work. You say in the uh, Justice Cascade that you came to that topic of justice completely by accident, but I still think that it's never just accident, right? There are accidents, but there is also something deep inside you. You mentioned that very early you went to uh, is Spain. Do you think that was probably the seeds of uh, the interest in, in human rights? Um, I, I think there's probably some you know, deep, maybe some deep connection, but I, I really stress the time I spent in Uruguay because I had a sense of like, what, here's Uruguay that's been democratic for almost the entire 20th century uh, and had a really proud tradition in terms of uh, political rights and socioeconomic rights. And then to see it descend in this awful dictatorship to be called the torture chamber of the Americas. And then you sort of say, what happened here? And it was that puzzle, literally that puzzle, that stayed with me uh, all this time wanting to answer that puzzle. Now, moving on a bit to your actual work on human rights, but before we talk about the substantive findings of your books, I wanted to talk a bit about your uh, methods, because I think you combine two really interesting uh, approaches uh, that are not often found, uh, I think, at least in the literature that I'm familiar with. The mm -hmm. first one is a strong emphasis on empirical data, mm -hmm. right? You uh, dig like the, the facts, the data about the issues that you are uh, talking about, which in law is clearly not uh, the, the main approach, but even in international relations, uh, social sciences, you see a lot of people advancing conclusions and opinions without doing the hard empirical work. Uh, uh, it's a more of the theoretical side, so you, you do the empirical work. And the other one is a strong personal tone that comes out in all of your books, which I think makes them uh, very interesting uh, and readable, but I think it might be also part of your methodology. So I wanted to explore the second one first. So you cite friends, family, uh, you describe events you participated in, uh, in your book. So in Evidence for Hope, for instance, uh, you describe this really uh, poignant Amnesty International meeting uh, just a week after Donald Trump had been elected, and there was this Zimbabwean pastor activist uh, present who had been in jail in Zimbabwe, uh, and you describe all that, and then you uh, come to the conclusion, and I quote, social change requires anger, hope, and the belief we can make a difference, which is the way you finished our lecture here yesterday uh, as, as well. So what I wanted to ask you is, uh, do you think this uh, combination uh, is important uh, also from a methodological perspective uh, in the sense that it, it strengthens 
your argument and uh, do you see any pitfalls in using that as well? Has anyone ever criticized you or uh, raised uh, any issues with that kind of approach? Right. So first, if you look at my earlier work, you're going to see I mainly do not use personal stories. Okay. Okay. And it was because it's not, uh, was not the considered uh, what to do in academic political science. So it's something I, I began to use more over time. And I began to use it over time because I wanted to reach a larger audience. So really after tenure, <laughs> uh, I realized I, I, I wanted to get just beyond my political science audience. And I wanted to talk to, in fact, I wanted to talk to some of the people I interviewed. So when Margaret Keck and I wrote the book, The uh, Activist Beyond Borders, we interviewed all these human rights activists for our research. And we realized, well, at a minimum, we wanted the people we interviewed to read the book, uh, 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 give us feedback on the book, and maybe you know, find it useful. And so it had to be written in a way that it was going to engage those people and not bore them out of their minds, like, as yeah. you know, a lot of political science can do. Yeah. Um, and so I think it was that book we start making the change, um, and then people responded well to that. Uh, they also used the book more in their teaching, because we discovered when you're writing for human rights activists, you also it helps you write for let's say undergraduate students. So inadvertently, then we we discovered that if we if we wrote in that more conversational tone, that it would be a, a better book for teaching as well. Yeah, that's certainly the case, uh, that it makes it much more interested, interesting and readable, as I said. But are there any pitfalls to that yeah. uh, strategy? Or would you recommend someone starting, not tenured yet, <laughs> to do the same thing? Uh, no, I, I, actually, I actually think there are pitfalls, and, and therefore I would not recommend it to someone before tenure. Okay, that's actually a good recommendation for me then, because as you know, I'm writing a book on the right to health, and I have this great uh, story uh, which came out of empirical work I did in the northeast of Brazil uh, on the right to health with uh, these activists that got together to fight uh, for the health system to give them uh, treatment for a re very rare disease that 44 children, uh, for some reason no one can explain yet, uh, have in that particular region uh, of, of Brazil. And I, I thought it was a great, it might be a great way of opening the book, telling the story of these uh, people with their consent, obviously, if uh, mm -hmm. they, they, they give me that, that, that consent. But you think maybe it shouldn't no, be... Well, uh, no, one, I, I'd like to even hear more about the story first, so can you tell me a little more about it? Yes, I can give names, uh, obviously, but these are, but it's public because it's in the courts. So mm -hmm. these are, uh, this is a disease called Epidermolysis bullosa, which is a disease that uh, children are born with, a uh, congenital disease, where their skin, when it uh, bruises, cannot heal. So they lack a substance that we all have in our skin, which when we have a cut, like in two days, it's gone. They never heal. Like, so the very act of being born, coming out, bruises, bruises them all over. And then uh, you cannot put uh, plasters because they will glue to the wound. So it's a terrible disease. Their hands with time end up like uh, what is called mitten uh, hands, like all glued as well. They cannot play because if they fall, like they have a bruise. So it's a really debilitating disease. And there is no treatment as yet. But there is a very expensive uh, curative plaster mm -hmm. from Sweden that uh, is available to uh, just as a palliative, like to, to get their lives a bit more bearable and better. But it has a very huge cost that the health system wasn't prepared to uh, pay. Mm -hmm. So this really amazing woman uh, who I interviewed there, whose son has the disease, uh, found out that there were all other, many other uh, people with the mm -hmm. same disease and uh, got together and they went to courts and the courts gave them through the right to health litigation, mm -hmm. uh, forced the state to buy uh, these plasters uh, for them. So every month they have to buy these plasters and she distributes it among the people who need it. 
but there are all, always problems, obviously, that they don't arrive or they arrive at a lesser quantity than they need. But it's a, a good story, to, I think, to show the dilemma of judicialization. Yes, this is the kind of uh, thing that I think put doubt even in the skeptics' minds like me. Is it something that judges should not be giving mm -hmm. like, uh, based on the, on the right to health? So that's the story. All right, but you're right, it's a very poignant story. And it's almost a story that you tell against your research, right? Because yeah. you create such sympathy for these children. <clears throat> and yet your research may suggest that maybe the health system cannot afford to pay for their treatment? Well, that, that was my instinct. But after going there, talking to these people, seeing the real uh, harm that that disease causes and how better their lives can get with that treatment, I, I'm not sure. Right. That's one of the cases I say tests mm -hmm. uh, where it's a dilemma. There are some cases where you are clear about the answer, mm -hmm. or we shouldn't be paying for that. Others that you're sure we should, like vaccinations, basic health care. This falls somewhere in the middle. There are rare diseases because these people will never be a large enough group to be able to pressurize politics to include their needs in the policies. Mm -hmm. And that's where perhaps courts might uh, play a legitimate role in giving them voice through the, the judiciary. Yeah. So now let me amend what I said earlier, because there's various kinds of personal statements and stories one can use in research. And the story you just described uh, from a point of view of someone who does comparative politics is an entirely and important and appropriate story to tell in any book written by scholars at any, at any stage in their career. Mm -hmm. Okay, because that is just qualitative, the results of qualitative research is qualitative evidence uh, and illustration for uh, your research. Okay, and so I would of course tell that story. What I was saying is that as I moved further in my career, I began to do things that were maybe a little uh, yeah, less understand. part of qualitative research. And then as I started telling more personal stories, not just I was there and they told me this story, because it's about them, it's not really about you. Yeah. But more personal stories saying, let, let, you know, this is something uh, tell, I, I tell about in Evidence for Hope, I, t I tell about my mother, for example, and I say, you know, uh, my mother, wanted to work and she was told she could only have one of three jobs, a secretary, yeah. a, a, a teacher, or a nurse. And she liked science and so she was a nurse, right? So that's the kind of story that begins to kind of move more to the personal and I might not, uh, I might not have used that earlier. I see. But, but uh, no, so for people who do, I was trained in comparative politics and in international relations, comparative politics of Latin America. One of the people who was on my uh, dissertation committee was Al Steppen, mm -hmm. who was a Brazilianist, and, and comparative politics people, it is an article of faith and it's a necessary condition for being someone in comparative politics. You go to the field and you do lengthy field research and you interview many people and you do sometimes participant observation. Um, and that is a, a crucial part of, of your research. In fact, you can't be a serious comparative politics scholar without having done it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so that's something that I bring with me uh, to international relations that doesn't quite have the same field research tradition. I understand. I wanted to move on to a related issue, which is another uh, perhaps uh, sensitive combination, which is uh, quite uh, common to find in our area, which is human rights, which is ac activism and academia. Right, uh, and uh, I suppose that's constantly in the minds of some academics focusing on human rights, whether it's possible, and if so, how to reconcile these both strengths. Uh, what are the perils and promises of being at the same time uh, an academic and an activist? Mm -hmm. Well, the first I would say is that I consider myself primarily an academic. Uh, I was for two years an activist, almost two years at WOLA, and what I discovered was that I wasn't cut out to be an activist. And the reason I left WOLA, they, I was asked to be a staff person, I was asked to stay on with them. And at that point, I decided I, I had the opportunity to go to graduate school, I should go to graduate school. The reason I decided that is because I kept saying, 
don't you think we should do a little more research on this topic before we jump to activism? Uh, and they would say, no, we don't have time for research. We're in a crisis. We have to you know, move ahead with our activism. And so I discovered, actually, I did not, I totally believed in the issues. I had amazing colleagues. And I didn't have the temperament to be an activist. I really had the temperament of a researcher. Even so, my entire life, I've kept a link in the sense I would like my research to be of use to activism. Mm -hmm. uh, and I continue to always uh, uh, interview activists and learn from them about their work. Okay. Uh, but there is a tension. I think it came up in our lecture last night, right? You had someone in the back of the room saying, uh, uh, asking a really important question, saying, well, what about people on the ground, activists on the ground? How do they you know, feel about uh, your research? And you know, sometimes activists think my research is useful, and sometimes they don't. Uh, for example, when I say there's evidence for hope and things are getting better, some activists will say, no, my problem, my son disappeared and I have never received justice. Yeah. And until I receive justice for my son, it is you know, unacceptable we have complete impunity. And so I was saying, no, I, the Argentines tell me this, we have complete impunity in Argentina. And I say, I understand why you feel that way because of your situation. But I'm a researcher. I created a database about human rights prosecutions in the entire world. And Argentina has had more human rights prosecutions than any other country. So it's not complete impunity in a comparative, in an empirical sense. It's actually the best example of uh, accountability in the world. And so I'm prepared to have those discussions with people, but I try not to be, in, you know, I try not to be insensitive to, to their perspective. And what, what would happen, like just a hypothesis, if through your serious empirical research, which you are more cut out, as you said, to do than the early activism that you were focusing on, you found no evidence for hope? Let's say, <laughs> would you uh, carry on doing research on this topic or would you move on to uh, something else? Well, obviously, I never would have written a book with this topic. I never would have even arrived at this book topic. Okay. But let's, so then we'd have to go back to my, my previous book, which was, uh, or previous books, but particularly The Justice Cascade, which is my, the book before this one. And in that book, I literally say in the book that uh, I'm, uh, looking at whether or not human rights prosecutions have a positive effect on human rights outcomes. And I say in the book that should I have found that human rights prosecutions have a negative impact, they worsen human rights, I would have been prepared to say maybe we should find other ways of accountability. Okay. So the critics said that, right? The critics said human rights prosecutions undermine democracy, worsen human rights, um, I didn't believe it because my qualitative research had not suggested that. But I, when I did the quantitative research, I was prepared to, f to find either outcome and follow that outcome to its logical uh, uh, conclusion. Yeah, but that, in that book, there was less at stake, right? It was only whether criminal prosecutions, which is a small part of the human rights system, work or not. In Evidence for Hope, you expanded for a much more ambitious project which is about the whole system of human rights law, institutions, uh, and movements. Mm -hmm. So to have found, uh, I, I'm glad you found evidence for hope, because I think uh, it's not only uh, uh, well uh, supported by evidence, as we'll talk about later, uh, but also because gives uh, activists, as you say, you want your work to be uh, important for them, uh, hope in a time where, as you also describe well in the book, some are even going through psychological depression because of uh, the perception that the world mm -hmm. is going bad. But had you found in that more uh, expensive, uh, ambitious project that there was no evidence, I think it would be different from the justice cascade, right? In the justice cascade, you could just say, okay, criminal prosecutions don't work, but human rights is still like a huge uh, system. So I would actually say this book is really the culmination okay. of research I've been doing on human rights. Or, so my first human rights article uh, was published in the early 90s. Uh, 
And so we're talking almost 30 years of research on human rights. And in every first, the first part of the book is about the legitimacy of human rights. And it particularly takes on this issue uh, that some critics say that human rights only comes from the global north, from the United States and Western Europe, and it's imposed on the rest of the world, on the global south, uh, uh, kind of against their will. But virtually every book I've ever written on uh, human rights has looked at some issue of protagonism from the global south. And in fact, if you want to say, even going back to the Sepal book, Sepal was all about protagonists from the global south. Okay? And so I had, always, I had always researched and I'd always known about this Latin American protagonism uh, in promoting uh, human rights ideas. And so if, if you wish, chapters you know, three and four of this book uh, are just sort of a summary of things that I've been researching for a long time, but I was able to put it in a couple of chapters. I also moved in this book that I moved beyond Latin America and I looked at, at protagonism from the global south from other parts of the global south. So I discuss India, I look at South Africa and the anti-apartheid uh, campaigns, uh, the whole decolonization movement. And so I do, I do broaden out uh, and did new research to be able to broaden out, but it's based on research I did quite a while ago. Uh, and so in that sense, it's not, it's not like a new piece of research, it's like a summary uh, of, of research. Um, so the second half of the book also draws on earlier research, and in particular two edited volumes I did with Thomas Risa and Stephen Robb, uh, the first in 1999 called The Power of Human Rights, and then the second in 2013 Persistent. called The Persistent Power of Human Rights, uh, using uh, qualitative research. And those uh, volumes both talk, work a lot on the effectiveness question. And so I had a lot of reason to believe about effectiveness coming out of qualitative research, both on the legitimacy and the effectiveness question, uh, and that I brought to the second half of this book. Okay, uh, another related uh, issue, uh, which is about the role of the academic uh, mm -hmm. who is doing research on human rights, but I suppose that applies to other fields as well. At one point in Evidence for Hope, uh, you strongly criticize uh, a Columbia professor, Bernard Harcourt, for doing only critique and not solutions. So to quote you, say, providing anything in the way of concrete proposals for change is, he, is what he doesn't do, and this is also the duty of uh, an academic. Can you uh, expand on that and uh, to perhaps help some academic who is doing research on these topics and has some um, concerns that if he gets too much involved with uh, policy, uh, solutions, and therefore some activism as well, uh, it might undermine uh, the scientific uh, neutrality, let's say, of his, his findings. Right. So let me just paint that picture a little more for you, because the, the actual event was an event, I think, four days after the Trump election. It was, uh, and it was a group of us who'd been asked to talk about human rights. Uh, Samuel Moyne was there, I was there, and Bernard Harcourt, who I'd not met before, but who uh, uh, is an, uh, a, a critical legal scholar. Um, and he stood up and said, we, you know, we only need to offer critique. We ha are under no obligation whatsoever to offer any proposals for change. And it struck me particularly that that's a very common position that critical legal scholars and critical theorists in my field as well say. You know, Derrida famously said, deconstruction is justice. Uh, and so they believe they can just deconstruct the world and they have done their share. Okay. Uh, I have long been opposed to that position. I feel it's irresponsible. I don't think deconstruction alone is justice. I think that deconstruction or critique is often a, a really important first step towards justice, but the no, if you don't take the next step, you can leave people with a sense of despair and no notion of, of the direction to take. Okay. So, when Harker did that, at that moment, I really stood up and I said, this gives us insight into the bankruptcy of this approach. To stand here four days after Trump's election, when, we, when we're, the, this, the room is full of students and other people who feel despair 
and to just heap more critique on, on the human rights system, on the human rights system, not heap critique on Trump, on the human rights system mm -hmm. and all of its defects and not say one word about a way forward, I felt was, uh, 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 you know, it was unsupportable. So to go back to the other important aspect of your approach, which I mentioned earlier, uh, alongside the personal tone, the empirical uh, uh, methodology that you, you use, uh, in all of your books, uh, Activists Beyond Borders, Justice Cascade, Evidence for Hope, uh, the power of human rights, the persistent power of human rights, you seem to be on a crusade against <laughs> what we might call human rights pessimists, right? There's people who believe that uh, the, the human rights system uh, hasn't done uh, anything or even have made things uh, worse. And your main tool, and I think it's a powerful one, against this kind of uh, uh, opinion, position, is empirical uh, research. We'll, we'll discuss like what you actually found uh, uh, soon, but I wanted uh, on a final question about methodology which might help others doing uh, research in this area. Why do you think empirical methodology is so important and should we all become familiar with it, like lawyers, activists, philosophers, all of those who work in the field uh, of human rights uh, or at least human rights effectiveness? So first I want to say I'm not on a crusade. <laughs> I, I expected that you would. Uh, and I, I do like kind of catchy titles for my books, uh, and, but I, I, my first commitment, as you said, is to empirical research, and I'm prepared to follow the results of my empirical research where they lead. And in fact, in my, and I hope we'll get a chance, but my, my forthcoming book, so this book, yeah, Evidence for well. Hope, is a critique of uh, two positions that I feel are not supported by evidence. One is about the, 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 the perceived illegitimacy of human rights because it comes from the global north. I think that's just bad history. And one is the notion that the, uh, you know, human rights has led to no marked, human rights law institutions and movements have led to no marked decrease in human rights violations. And that's utterly unsupported by evidence. Okay, so here I, I do, I defend if you wish, <laughs> against two arguments that I feel are just poor arguments unsupported by historical or, or empirical evidence. In my new book, I'm articulating a critique of my own. I've said, okay, it's not that we can't critique human rights. We can critique human rights, but let's critique it, I think, uh, uh, in a way that maybe is more substantiated. And the critique I'm making is, of course, there's problems with human rights implementation. There are big gaps between where we wish we were with human rights in the world and where we are. Uh, and so we do have to really work at better human rights implementation. And there's many ways to do that. Um, and, but the one way I've decided to focus on is a focusing more on responsibilities to implement human rights. Okay, one of the dilemmas about human rights is we claim rights and we argue that states have responsibilities for fulfilling those rights. Sometimes, increasingly, maybe corporations have responsibilities. Uh, but with many rights, it's very important that a wider range of actors who are socially connected to a rights violation all take responsibility to address that rights violation. And I feel like the human rights movement has, and human rights law, but I'm actually making a political and ethical argument, has been too hesitant to talk about responsibilities to implement rights. Okay, we'll go back to that topic because I mm -hmm. think it's really interesting on the limitations of the human rights uh, system and language uh, to achieve uh, more social progress uh, in the world. But let's mm -hmm. like focus now a bit on your substantive findings uh, in, the, in your books, especially the, the latest one, uh, Evidence uh, for Hope. So to start with that first historical uh, record that I think uh, you uh, set uh, correct uh, in, in the, what you call the flawed history of human mm -hmm. rights that many people tell, because I think it's interesting, especially for uh, Latin Americans like me, mm -hmm. uh, to, 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 to read uh, 
in your book, in page 75, for instance, you talk about the American Declaration of the Rights and Duties of Man, which was, uh, came before the right. Universal Declaration, and no one knows about it. So really, in some ways, the, the origin of, uh, of my interest in some of these responsibility issues comes from the research I did for this book, when I, I finally really discovered the American Declaration of Rights and Duties and of duties. Man. And duties of man. Um, from April 1948, um, and it's called the American Declaration, but it's it should be called the Latin American Declaration. It was 20 Latin American states and the United States present in Bogota, Colombia, uh, at the ninth International Conference of the American States, where the OAS was also created. Um, and at, but at that point, in addition to creating the OAS, they create the first intergovernmental declaration in the world of human rights. And no one seems to remember that. It was created eight months before the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Last year was the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Everywhere, all over the world, there were 70th anniversary parties for the Universal Declaration in no, how, any, virtually no place in the world, including throughout Latin America, including in Bogota, Colombia, where it happened, was there any recognition of the American Declaration. So what's going on? Uh, and, and at the same time, people like you know, Stephen Hopgood can, uh, or, or can say, human rights comes from the global north. Uh, and so people are erasing the history of Latin America. I'm very curious why that history of Latin America has been erased. And I think part of it has been uh, that scholars in the global north don't do research in the global south. Okay, that's one part. A second part is that dictatorships in the global south was in Latin America, for example, was very useful for them to erase that history, right? And so Brazil, for example, in, 19, in that very meeting in 1948 proposes that there should be an inter-American court of human rights. It was a resolution, a Brazilian resolution. We need an Inter-American Court. It's tabled and sent to the Inter-American Juridical Committee. But the Brazilian dictatorship after 64 didn't want to remind people that it had proposed a, a, a regional human rights court. It was easier for the Brazilians to say, that's Jimmy Carter, that's an American imperialist intervention in our domestic affairs, rather than recognizing its own protagonism of its own uh, uh, country back in 1948. Right. So I think there's various reasons why that we've, we've erased that history, uh, but I want to reclaim it, uh, and, and that's one of the things I do in the book. And I think you do that really well, and that's perhaps the less, at least from my perspective, controversial part of the book, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's history, you can show it, mm -hmm. that there were many uh, representatives uh, of the Global South, also in the UN, at the UN Declaration, you can show that Latin America had been talking about these rights from a much earlier period, that this American Declaration itself was based in Latin American constitutions, mm -hmm. which already had these rights like much earlier than that. Mm -hmm. I think the more, more, more controversial part of your book, uh, I, I don't know if you agree, is the second one about uh, effectiveness, right? Because uh, a, 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 as the title and the empirical evidence uh, uh, show, you think the pessimists are wrong, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and then, uh, as you saw uh, yesterday in the lecture, I suppose you get that everywhere you go to talk about the book, uh, it, it sounds counterintuitive for many people who are living under Trump, Erdogan, Putin, Bolsonaro now in Brazil. Mm -hmm. I want to talk a bit more about him later if, you, um, if we can. Uh, Syria, Yemen, Venezuela, uh, to think, really? Are, 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 are human rights really uh, improving? So I, I wanted to use a distinction that Steven Pinker, who I know you, you're citing in, in the book as well, makes uh, between uh, two types of optimism, mm -hmm. complacent optimism and uh, conditional optimism. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember the distinction mm -hmm. he makes of, in the environmental chapter, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so would you say you are a complacent <laughs> or a conditional optimist? Well, the first thing is that one of, the pe one of the reasons people fear talking about progress is they fear that we will become complacent, right? And so uh, in, in a number of places in the book I talk about uh, we need uh, to have hope without complacency. 
So people think uh, we need human rights activists themselves think we need to keep talking about how bad things are because otherwise people won't be able to to, to maintain their activism. Uh, and so, uh, of course, one doesn't want to be a complacent optimist. To the contrary, I've reached the, the, the different position, as I said in the talk last night, uh, that our problem today is not complacency. Our problem is despair. So many people are despairing that I think we need evidence for hope to help sustain their struggles. Right? Not, not because We don't have to worry about complacency right now. Um, but my bigger issue is not about complacent versus conditional. My bigger issue is about the long term versus the short term. And so as I said last night, I'm not telling anybody, I am, I'm not optimistic about the United States right now. Okay? I'm very, very concerned about what's happening in the United States and the effect that U.S. policies have on the world and about human rights around the world. I'm not asking you as a Brazilian to be, uh, I, I know that, that you are not. We'll talk about it more about yeah. Bolsonaro, right? Well, there was a, a, a colleague in our workshop yesterday who spoke very eloquently about Turkey. And I said, I was in Turkey last October. I gave a speech in Turkey. And the first thing I said is, I, I understand that people in Turkey today uh, are, are under assault and that many academics have lost their job there just for signing a petition for peace. Mm -hmm. And it's been used to remove them from their jobs. Um, but my point is to look at the longer term and say, even if you know, we have these problems today, uh, but if you look over the longer term, you'll say that human rights institutions, law, and movements have been powerful forces to contribute to positive change we can use that knowledge to sustain the necessary struggles today against ongoing repressive regimes. Okay. But what I try to remind people of is like, it's, there's not a golden moment in the past where human rights were good and now they're bad. You know, I started working in the 70s in all of Latin America, you know, except Costa Rica at that time and Venezuela were the only two democracies in the entire region. And Colombia, except it had a huge civil war, was a democracy. And so my memory is, you know, when in Latin America's entirely repressive regimes, and so when people tell me, oh, things were good back then, now they're bad, it's like, I'm sorry, but you, you don't remember. You have a rosy eyeglasses of the past. But every people say, oh, the 90s, things were good. The 90s was the genocide in Rwanda and the genocide in the Balkans. Um, and so there's not a rosy moment in the past that we can go to where, where human rights were good and today they're bad. Okay, we have unique problems today, and that is the problem of these electoral authoritarians, right? People like uh, 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 Erdogan in, in, in Turkey, right? Or like Orban in Hungary, who, who came to power through elections, and in, in some cases through democratic elections, and then used their, their electoral power to basically uh, 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 undermine democracy, in fact, turn their countries into authoritarian regimes. That's a new problem, using mm -hmm. democracy so cleverly that you can undermine it with uh, using the rules. Uh, and that's a problem we have to really focus our attention on. But it's not a new repression today that didn't exist in the past. So I think you explained really well uh, uh, why there is this disjunction uh, uh, that of a perception that the things are getting uh, bad or have never been worse and the actual empirical historical data on, on, on human rights. And uh, yeah, I think your book is great at uh, trying to explain why that this, this junction exists. So you talk about information bias, you talk about changing standards of accountability, and I want to explore that uh, a bit more. But I think there's also uh, uh, the, the situation that many people are experiencing right now in their own countries. You mentioned the U.S. You are not very hopeful about the U.S. at the moment. I'm not very hopeful about Brazil, the Turkish uh, situation that was uh, talked about uh, yesterday. So I think uh, your book gives us evidence for hope that... Uh, things have improved in the long term and if we think of the world as a whole. But for these people who are living in these countries, mm -hmm. the short term is what is important, right? There is someone who said that phrase, in the long term we are all dead, right? So Keynes. Keynes, yeah, Keynes, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, 
I wonder whether we'll, we'll talk about uh, the, uh, your explanations for the disjunction later, but what about for these people who are quite worried right now? Because I think these are the people who get a bit more disconcerted about a book, Evidence for Hope, when they're experiencing in their own lives, perhaps, the worst situation that they have ever done under Trump and uh, uh, Bolsonaro. Mm -hmm. um, different countries, people in different countries you know, are in different situations, right? In the United States, our democracy, quality of our democracy has declined, but we still live in a democracy, and so the tools open are clear and are being used, and it's, ca it's called you know, social mobilization and especially electoral mobilization, right? One big problem we have in, in the United States is that many, many people, including the great you know, uh, 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 majority of young people, were not voting in elections, and they need to step forward. Their share. In a place like uh, 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 Turkey, it's different because they've already moved into a repressive period where pe professors can be uh, 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 fired just for signing a petition. Right? That requires other methods. But you know, you're the expert in Brazil. What do you say? What should people be doing and, and thinking about in Brazil right now? Yeah. So my concern is uh, related to what Stephen Hopgood said yesterday in the lecture. Because uh, you seem to agree with all your empirical evidence uh, mm -hmm. about progress in the long term, but his concern, which I think is the concern of a lot of people like me in Brazil and people in the U.S. as well, is that these things might unravel pretty quickly, and we might the, this democracy backslide we are seeing today might descend into like a, a real collapse of of democracy. Now, I'm usually an optimist, so I, 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 I thought, uh, and I still think, I think, that it, it's a blip that uh, democracies are resilient enough to uh, uh, survive this wave of more authoritarianism that we are seeing around the world, but I can't be sure of that. And I think you also say in the book, we can't be sure that this is not uh, the fact that we had progress in the past doesn't mean that we'll keep having progress in the future. I think we need to keep the struggle uh, exactly. up, right? So I agree with you that this is what we should do in Brazil and in other places, and this is what we are doing. Mm -hmm. But the doubt is whether we will be strong enough, we human rights supporters, democracy supporters, to withstand this clear wave of authoritarianism that is, uh, is spreading uh, across other countries. So I truly don't know the answer to that. I, if I had to, to bet, I would say Trump will be out in four years or maybe eight, and we, uh, Bolsonaro will also perhaps even earlier, and we'll get back to uh, a, a more progressive uh, times like uh, quite soon. But the opposite could also uh, happen if uh, they, these guys manage to undermine uh, democracy and human rights. So it depends on what uh, Stephen Hopgood said yesterday, but I don't think we have uh, empirical evidence for that, right? He said that the commitment to human rights, and I would include democracy there, is not very deep. And what worries him is how so suddenly 30% of populations in even well established democracies got behind this populist. Um, movements. As an optimist, I would still say, well, 70% haven't, so maybe the 70, but then is where complacency mm -hmm. might be uh, a problem. So I think what you said earlier is really interesting, but there is a fine balance between despair and complacence. And I think that in some places, perhaps, where in the short term things uh, seem to be getting worse, complacence might be uh, a, 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 a greater risk danger than despair. People who are not uh, voting, participating. I, I think actually in the United States, among young people, complacency it, it was an important issue, right? And I did interviews with Harvard, I did focus groups with Harvard undergraduates, and it, a couple things were clear. One is they you know, had, grew, had mainly grown up during you know, to the, the Obama administration, and they just sort of took certain things for granted. Um, and were busy, and voting was complicated, and so you know many of them just didn't vote. 
But then there was a second issue, which was the belief that our political system, you know, that they mm -hmm. would have that they would have no voice, that their voice didn't count, their vote didn't count, and therefore they didn't vote because it was irrational to vote. And they yeah. would say, well, maybe if you live in Boston for the presidential elections, but the midterm elections you know, are, are determining all sorts of important uh, uh, state offices as well as national offices uh, where your vote does count. So that's why I say it's a fine balance between complacence and despair, right? Because there are a lot of people who think, oh, things have never been better, and therefore I don't need to worry that much. You know, I don't need to go out and vote, protest, and others who think, well, even if I do, like, it doesn't work. So mm -hmm. I think it's a fine balance. But to go back to uh, your empirical evidence you present in your book and your explanations for why with such uh, uh, amount, uh, amount of empirical evidence showing that many things have got better, some have got worse. It's important to say that you don't only put positive uh, data uh, in your book, but why with so much positive uh, data, uh, empirical data, so many people are still uh, pessimists. Uh, my father was a neurosurgeon. And uh, he, uh, during his career, MRI scans mm -hmm. came up. And he, I remember him telling us at the dinner table that now we can detect much more aneurysmas, which was the thing he operated uh, in, in the brain, brain than, than we could before. I think in your book you say that something similar happens with human rights uh, information, right? And so the public health field has a word for this, what your father found, and it's called surveillance bias or detection bias. And by that they mean when we look more closely, we find more illness, right? Including if we look with these imaging machines. I argue that human rights actually suffers from something called surveillance bias as well, uh, or detection bias, and that is we are looking more closely at human rights around the world and we're finding more violations. That's very good news for human rights in the sense that we're calling attention to human rights violations of more people in more parts of the world. But it can give the, 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 the belief that things are getting worse rather than that we know more and care more than ever before about human rights. So it can fuel despair uh, as well. So again, it's uh, uh, a, a tool that has a positive and a negative side to it, which is, I think, the same with the changing standards of uh, accountability, which is the other explanation you, right. you give, right? Mm -hmm. So by that we mean that the human rights field both has introduced many new rights, right? So today we are, have important human rights campaigns on rights for disability, uh, the disabled people, uh, LGBT rights, for example, rights of indigenous peoples, and so uh, we have a change in that accountability because we are paying attention to new rights or existing rights are, uh, ha we have a, a higher standard of existing rights. The European Court of Human Rights has, over time, its jurisprudence has changed its definition of torture quite dramatically. So things that it did not call torture two decades ago, now it does. You mentioned in another interview, I think, that uh, human rights contain the seeds of its own expansion. Uh, and it, again, is this also a good and a bad thing at the same time. I spoke about my father. Yesterday in the lecture, he spoke about your father and the fact that only if, uh, not that long ago, you wouldn't think that ramps would be a matter of human rights, right? And now they are. So I said I was so, it, you know, I, I'm a human rights person and I didn't even, it didn't even occur to me even 20 years ago that the absence of a ramp was a human rights violation. And this is good, right? It's an expansion of human rights that has brought even if it has some negative consequences that our standards are rising and is creating yeah. some despair, but it's also good for people who are included. Right, so to bring in you know, your colleague, John Tassoulis, he's doing some writing now to say we have to uh, think about whether we should label every good thing in the world a right. Mm. And there are many good things which you would say it's in our interest to have this, we should make these policy changes, but we may not want to label them a right. And that was my next question to you, because someone in the audience yesterday mentioned the environment as our greatest challenge, mm -hmm. uh, alongside equality, which I will also ask you about uh, afterwards. And then you said, no, this is not a matter of human rights, right? So you think there is limits in this expansion? So ramps 
for people who own wheelchairs is a good expansion of human rights language, but the environment isn't. Well, why not? If it's such a powerful tool for change, is it not our best hope of trying to stop climate change to conceptualize it as a human rights issue? I actually, I actually am not opposed to, I said, you know, there's been this whole mobilization, not just we have a right to clean environment, but the trees have rights, rivers have rights, in Latin America, Pachamama, the earth goddess, literally has rights in the constitution of Bolivia and Ecuador. Yeah. Okay, so it's not so much I'm opposed as I think it doesn't get us very far. And in order to move ahead on, on climate change and the environment, we really have to move to the responsibilities issue. Everyone has to step forward and say, if we are socially connected to the problem of climate change, not because we're to blame for it. We're pa we have to be forward-looking. We're past the blame moment with climate change. Everyone socially connected to climate change with the capacity to act needs to take responsibility and needs to act or else we won't deal with this challenge. But how do you get responsibilities without a corresponding right, right? As a lawyer, a human rights lawyer, we always think of rights and duties as two sides uh, of the same coin. And that's why human rights uh, language seems so powerful because you establish a right only, as our colleague here in the law school, Joseph Raz, has famously uh, uh, developed this argument when it, it, it's an interest that is important enough to impose duties on others to do something. You think we can have those duties without the corresponding so rights? I'm using the word responsibility on purpose, exactly, to move a little away from this legal, okay. this legal duties language, you know, the old, that every, for every right there must be a duty. Right? Uh, because I think when, and I, I use the research of Iris Marion Young, her beautiful book, Responsibility for Justice, mm -hmm. right? One can actually have responsibilities without necessarily uh, uh, corresponding rights, right? And she argues that responsibilities are um, discretionary, which if it's a real right, the responsibilities aren't discretionary sometimes, because all of us need to do something for climate change, but we, we won't all do the same thing. So it's not like there's a responsibility that all of us must do, but we all must choose to take some responsibility in that area, and we must pressure our institutions to, to, to take their responsibilities. So a final uh, question about the other challenge that uh, the gentleman yesterday, which was actually my colleague Ewan Magogi, uh, asked you about, which was the two greatest challenges he said we are facing now, environment and inequality, and in neither of them human rights uh, seem to uh, be making uh, a difference. You showed a graph of inequalities, which I thought, again, with this empirical data, you show that people keep repeating things without actually knowing what's happening. So inequality is not growing everywhere in the world. It depends on, on how you measure. Inequality is um, uh, among countries is actually decreasing. Within countries, it depends. In the US, United States and in the English-speaking countries that you showed in the graph, it's growing. In others, uh, it's not or not as much. Uh, but focusing on the US and going back to a biographical uh, aspect uh, as we started to finish. Uh, you mentioned your mother and that mm -hmm. she con could only choose like three different professions, but you also, I think somewhere, uh, said that when you started studying uh, as a graduate student, you could never think that you might one day become a professor of uh, political science, uh, anywhere, let alone at Harvard, right? It mm -hmm. was only ma men who were uh, uh, professors. So things have clearly changed, right, from those times, and the rights of women have really mm -hmm. improved, and that's what you show also in your book. But my question is uh, related to inequality. Uh, at least in these countries where inequality is growing, even if it's not the greatest challenge like the environment that we have globally and in some countries it's diminishing, in some countries like the US, someone might say, now a poor person can never aspire to be a professor at Harvard, right? Or not even study at Harvard. Do you think uh, this is a, an important problem that might also be fueling this despair that people have, not about just about human rights, democracy in general, that things may not be uh, worse than they've ever been, but this inequality aspect is kind of corroding uh, societies in different ways, which are also important. 
So your question suggests there are many forms of inequality in the world. Economic inequality is one of them, but status inequality is another. And the human rights movement has been the most powerful movement to address status inequality. Status, gender, right? Gender inequality is huge and been yeah. reduced dramatically. Uh, inequality with regard to, to race, religion, ethnicity are also forms of status inequality that human rights has addressed. Increasing addressing status equality with regard to sexual identity, right, uh, by uh, with same-sex marriage and others. And so here we have a powerful movement that's made status inequality one of its main targets and has succeeded. We also know that economic inequality is related to status inequality. In other words, as long as women couldn't uh, get a, a, a good wage in the workforce, they were going to have economic inequality also vis-a-vis -vis men. And, and racial inequality, we know that if people are racially discriminated against, they're economically discriminated against. So status inequality links to economic inequality. It's not separate from that. Okay. So I'm, uh, having said that, I think human rights is not a powerless vehicle for various forms of economic inequality as well. But the human rights movement has to step forward and think creatively uh, about ways to address it. Your research has shown that sometimes litigating health policy in courts may not be the best way. My favorite new campaign is one that the Network for Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights is doing on tax havens as a way to address uh, economic inequality. And so we're going to have to say, for economic, social, and cultural rights, if the government is to have the funds to provide uh, rights, it needs to increase its tax revenues. Because the, the uh, covenant says that your obligations are limited by your, your resources. So we have to increase resources. We do that through increasing taxation. And tax evasion is the main source of diminishing taxation uh, uh, returns for governments. And so it's a human rights issue to deal with tax evasion. So a quick, brief question to finish. Should we have a human right against inequality? I believe that if all the rights in the Universal Declaration for Human Rights, now reflected in the two covenants, were fully respected, that would constitute the respect for a right to equality. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your time in London. Thank you.